Good morning. Uh, bonjour. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in Brussels, where I have uh, actually lived twice in my life. Um, I'm very happy to be here to talk about uh, my vision of the singularity. And my vision is that the singularity is actually already here, and that there is a new species that is going to be uh, dominating the planet um, by my 100th birthday, which happens to be in 2061. This species is one that's been around for a long time. Uh, it's one that's been around in very prototypical, rough form, but these changing technologies that we're all talking about are actually going to transform it into something else, something aware, conscious, evolving. And that's what is going to change the world, which is exactly what the singularity is about. Now, Walter asked, and a lot of you know what the singularity is. The general idea is that technological trends, when they grow so quickly and exponentially, end up coming up with results or predictions, or we just can't predict or even imagine what the world will be like when they express themselves. And so this is something that's been talked about for a while. Werner Vinge first introduced it, uh, at least as a term. Different people have talked about it, but it's, a, it's an old idea. The usual form it takes is that um, individual people, or maybe robots, will suddenly become superhuman. They'll live forever, they'll be incredibly intelligent, they'll have access to all of the world's knowledge as seamlessly as we have access to our own memories. I'm going to talk about a slightly different scenario. In this scenario, the idea is that uh, it looks at the points in the history of evolution where evolution happens by aggregation rather than by mutation or augmentation. Uh, we see it when organelles combine into complex cells, when cells combine into multicellular organisms, when multicellular organisms uh, diversify into internal organ systems, or when social bonds get created among individuals so that you have things like packs appearing. Um, I think that this kind of evolution is what we're on the verge of. What's changing? Aggregates have been around for a long time, as long as there have been tribes or packs or nation states or corporations, people have gotten together. But the thing is that the core of what one of these aggregates is, is information and communication. And the revolutions in technology have all been about information and communication. And so that's what's really going to change. And we're going to see things emerging from these aggregates that have not emerged before. So what happens, how, how is an aggregate individual different from uh, a regular individual? And, or, or just a bunch of people together. And the thing is that they evolve and they react and they respond in ways that are different from the ways that the individuals respond and react. So you really have something that's different. And part of what's happening is that because of the technology, the clock rate of organizations is increasing. I think we're all aware of that in one way or another. And it's gonna get to the point where in fact they do act a lot more like organisms. And one of the things that they'll also have even more of a concern for is their own sustainability, their stability, because that's what all organisms do. They, they, they seek homeostasis. They seek to keep themselves together. So this is one possibility, one vision, but there's a certain scary part of it. Now, I confess, when I first composed this slide, the first thought that came to me is, uh, which is the Mac and which is the PC? But I'm not going to go there. The real question is, why, don't, wh why isn't the scenario which we share of uh, the Borg from Star Trek, this notion of individuality being submerged into something greater, which is really a pretty horrific vision for those of us who are individuals and kind of like it. Um, the reason is that, in fact, the driving force for aggregation is diversity. It's the very thing that needs to be preserved. So, my argument for that, which is going to have a couple of steps, so, so, so hang with me, is that first off, the things that make us intelligent are the models we think with, the ways we think, the structures we have, those sorts of aspects. But the thing is that any individual model has limits. And because every individual model has limits, you actually have to have a multiplicity of mod models. 
and that makes diversity adaptive. And that's why aggregation, at some point, the only way you can get smarter is by becoming an aggregate rather than by just increasing the effectiveness of your individual models. Let me say a little bit about these different pieces. Um, my favorite example of how models make us smart actually comes from our speaker, David Brin's novel, Earth. He talks about how a common undergraduate or even freshman physics problem is figuring out the, the path of a ball that's dropped through the center of the Earth. Now, it's given as a weekend problem set to 18-year-olds. Um, it was something that Newton struggled for months with. And it's not that the 18-year-olds are 9,000 times smarter than Newton was. It's that we're giving these 18-year-olds the models, the ways of thinking that Newton and the giants on his shoulders all came up with. So models make us smart. But models also have limits. Now, this slide is actually my entire doctoral thesis crunched into one slide. So. Uh, Models have limits for lots of reasons, but one of them is that what a good model does is it makes useful things easy to uncover. So it makes sort of, it, it compresses the discovery paths or compresses the invention paths that allow you to get to a new interesting or useful idea. The problem is if you look at information theory, one of the things you find there is that uh, you actually can't make everything more compressed. Whenever you compress some things, you have to expand others. And so there's some point, which is limited by the entropy of the domain that you're modeling, where a model can actually only get better by getting narrower. The consequence of this is that diversity is adaptive. Whoever has just one model has a bad one. And in fact, we need to have multiple models, multiple ways of looking at the world in order to be effective. And because our models are tied up with our purposes, our identity, all these other things, um, we really have to put individuals together in order to have this multiplicity of models work. So that's why aggregates happen. It's where individuals come together and because of that, that's the way that they get smarter and more adaptive. And we're already seeing this happening and I'm going to talk about quickly about two places where it's happening. One is one that's been getting a lot of press recently. There's this great book by Michael Nielsen about it, and there's actually a great talk he gave at TEDx Waterloo. Um, the idea is that open science means that open data, open tools, open code are all changing the way that science happens. And his primary example of this kind of thing is some work by Tim Gowers, who's a, a mathematician, also happens to be a blogger at Cambridge University. He posted on his blog a mathematical problem that he really wanted to have a solution to. This was called the Polymath Project. Um, the, uh, he then invite, he put his own ideas out there. He invited other people to contribute. Over 37 days, there were 27 contributors, and they all came up with, eventually, a solution to the problem. Gowers described it as the polymath process is to regular research the way that driving a car is to pushing it. Here we're seeing a compound intelligence, if you will, coming up with things that would it have been possible with the same kind of speed or depth or versatility for a lone human being. Another thing that I'll just talk about briefly is work that I'm doing on social reading. The idea is to take reading, which is usually a solitary activity, or at least seems to be, and turn it into something which is social, so that it's connected with other kinds of things. And we have something in Alpha now that we're planning on rolling out next year. Um, the idea is to allow communities and marketplaces to uh, really change the way that people read. And I'll go through these slides quickly, which would have been the placeholder for a demo, and uh, talk a little bit about shadows and hope. Um, one thing is that some people would say that we already have this species and that they're corporations. And that corporations, since the Dutch East India Company, don't necessarily have a good reputation. Uh, but I don't think that uh, it necessarily has to be that way. Part of the problem is that corporations have, um, are mostly id, a little bit of ego in the form of brand, and no superego. So that's why you get what you get. 
But I think that there's actually signs for hope. There's lots of organizations which are doing great things, and they're getting better at it because of the technology that's with us. So in 2061, these aggregate species, these organizations brought to life and become conscious by virtue of these new technologies are going to be the dominant species on the planet. And the one thing that I'd like to say is let's make them of love. Thank you.